Revolutions Per Minute is a weekly radio show from the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, recorded live at WBAI 99.5 in Brooklyn every Wednesday at 9 p.m. RPM's about doing the work, the work to build a democratic socialist future. Each week, hear the latest news, analysis, and organizing experience from the minds and hearts of activists fighting every day in New York City. Join the movement at socialists.nyc. Yo, what's good, New York? I'm Jack Devine, he, him pronouns, and you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute live on WBAI. We're a socialist radio show and podcast for members of the New York City Democratic Socialists of America, DSA is the largest socialist organization in the United States, with 85,000 members nationwide, and NYC and DSA is its biggest chapter. We are run by our 7,000-plus members and organizers who are working together to build democratic socialism in all five boroughs. Last week, many New Yorkers celebrated Thanksgiving, but for members of the Shinnecock Nation, it was recognized as a day of mourning and the end of Sovereignty Camp 2020. A multi-week encampment led by indigenous women of the Shinnecock Nation to call on New York State to drop their lawsuit over a, a monumental billboard the nation has put up to bring in economic uh, development to its members who are suffering from 100 years of violent settler colonialism. We'll talk with Shinnecock tribal member and lawyer Tila Troge about Sovereignty Camp 2020 and the nation's centuries-long struggle to defend their ancestral territory. We'll also be jo joined by comrades from Suffolk DSA to talk about their campaign to defund the police and organize to build democratic socialism in a uniquely conservative region of downstate New York. But first, the headlines with Simone Norman. New York State Senate Democrats have secured the 42 seats needed for a veto-proof supermajority. The new political landscape gives state Democrats the power to override the governor's veto, potentially allowing them to implement legislation such as marijuana legalization, increased taxes on the wealthy, rent cancellation, and an eviction moratorium. It will also give Democrats control over the upcoming redistricting process. With Republicans losing influence in the New York State Senate, many of them are going to work for Andrew Cuomo in the governor's office. The first tenant was legally evicted in New York City since the pandemic started. NYC public elementary schools will reopen for in-person learning and abandon the hybrid learning model. The U.S. Supreme Court intervened to side with the religious communities who claimed that Governor Cuomo's executive order limiting congregation sizes in COVID hotspots is a violation of the First Amendment. Many prisoners who have been approved for release based on the state's new COVID guidelines remain behind bars, even as cases are surging again. Some city politicians, including mayoral candidate Eric Adams, have launched criticisms of ranked choice voting, which the city will begin using in next year's primaries, after being approved by voters via ballot initiative in November 2019. Polly Trottenberg, a candidate for U.S. Transportation Secretary under Biden, resigned as NYC Transportation Commissioner. David Dinkins, New York City's first and so far only black mayor, died at age 93. Finally, a proposed constitutional amendment would permanently expand voting by mail in New York. Proposed legislation, meanwhile, would speed up the vote counting process. And in election news, the Working Families Party announced another round of endorsements for the 2021 city council races, including an endorsement of NYC DSA endorsed Adolfo Abreu in the Bronx. And Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney of Poughkeepsie, a member of the centrist New Democrat Coalition, is in the running to lead the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. The previous head, Representative Sherry Bustos, stepped down after a poor showing by House Democrats in this month's elections.
Our headlines are brought to you by The Thorn, an incredible weekly newsletter by NYC DSA Electoral Working Group, covering local politics and radical activism. Subscribe at thethorn.nyc. So uh, we've got a, a co-hosting situation today, and I'm joined by our uh, a preeminent host, uh, Lee Zishi, who is, is always here for uh, expert analysis on uh, climate issues, and you can't talk about climate change without talking about uh, the history of settler colonialism in this country. So, Lee, you've been following up uh, what's been happening with the Shinnecock Nation. And so what's going on? Can you break that down uh, for our listeners and kind of sort of, I guess, introduce our uh, first guest for today? Yeah, you know, so, you know, the story of the Shinnecock Nation is really, you know, centuries of, um, you know, broken treaties and land theft. Um, you know, a lot of people know this area as the Southamptons, um, but there is a sovereign indigenous nation um, and people have, have lived in, the, their ancestors have lived in this area since, you know, time memorial. Um, but, you know, so it's, you know, a centuries old fight, um, but recently in, in the last couple of decades, as the ultra wealthy keep seeing this area um, as a vacation hotspot and now even more during COVID where they're, you know, fleeing the city um, to these re refugees of like pockets of wealth, um, there's been even more of attack on the Shinnecock Nation. There's been a golf course built on their burial grounds. Um, you know, native um, areas where they used to be able to fish um, are and collect things from the sea are being contaminated by all this overdevelopment. Um, and now they're being sued by New York. Um, you know, we hear a lot of, you know, apparently Tish James is progressive and so is Governor Cuomo, um, but they're actually suing the Shinnecock Nation um, for erecting a, a billboard memorial to help bring in economic development and also let people know, you know, you are driving on native land as they're, you know, escaping to their second homes. Um, so over this weekend, I, I talked with Tila, who is a, a member of the Shinnecock Nation and a lawyer in this fight to fight back against this lawsuit. Um, so let's go to that clip and hear what she has to say about what's going on. I'm here with Tila Troge, um, and today we'll be talking um, with her on RPM about the um, Shinnecock Nation and their struggle for sovereignty on their own land in what a lot of us know as the Hamptons. So welcome to, to RPM, Tila. Um, thanks so much for, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and so um, I really, we'd like to, our first question we would like to ask people is just to let our audience get to know you. You know, what would you like people to know about you? I'm a member of the Shinnecock Nation. I'm also a member of the Hassanamisko Nipmunk, and I'm uh, one of the main organizers of Sovereignty Camp 2020. Uh, we just wrapped up on the National Day of Mourning, otherwise known as Thanksgiving. So it's uh, been a couple of days post-action now. Yeah. And so um, I want to kind of first like start with, you know, why this, you know, you had this action in this particular moment. Um, the Shinnecock Nation, um, as I said, you know, a lot of people might know this area as the Hamptons, um, but this is actually, you know, the indigenous territory and actual, you know, sovereign nation um, of your people um, in what a lot of people know as the Hamptons. And there's been a long history of, of struggle there, um, but most recently um, you're being sued by the state of New York. Um, and could you talk a little bit about that lawsuit? Sure, absolutely. So the lawsuit is in relation to a monument to the Shinnecock Nation. Um, it's a 61 foot tall monument and it's located at our ancestral territory, a place called Nyamuk in our Algonquin language. Um, it's also had the name Canoe Place because it's, uh, geographically it's an isthmus, so it's the most narrow piece of land between two bodies of water. So that's where we, we would carry our canoes um, wherever we were traveling, whether it was to Connecticut or, you know, across the Atlantic. Um, and so um, now it's called Westwoods, but it's in a greater area known as um, Hampton Bays. And so um, I, as an attorney, am really interested in um, doing title work because um, just growing up um, around a, a lot of activists, um, they were always Clear, they always said there's no clear title in the Shinnecock Hills or in the town of Southampton. So I was really interested, like, what, is, what does that mean? So I learned how to 
do title searching. And so I spent about a year title searching the entire um, area of our Aboriginal territory. And I found an overwhelming amount of evidence since the earliest times that land records were kept that this land was always known as Indian land and always belonged um, to my nation. And so um, we had a really strong case going into this. Um, we really tried to work with the state of New York and the town of Southampton, but they just refused to work with us on a government to government level. Um, and so, you know, we let them know of our plans to build the monument sign. We shared our engineering drawings and spoke with them about safety and hurricanes and all of this. And so New York State, in response, sued us um, the day that we finished constructing the monument site. And so we've been engaged in litigation ever since. And I um, currently took on a new role within the nation of being the COVID-19 director. And so, you know, on one hand, I had worked really hard on getting this monument um, put up in New York State through a lawsuit on it, and it wasn't generating any of the revenue that it was supposed to. And so um, when COVID hit, we had a really bad economic fallout out here. And um, people who are already living um, below the poverty line were just doing so much worse. And there was a lot of homelessness. There's a lot of food insecurity out here. Um, and there's not a lot of assistance for anyone. The local governments really aren't doing anything to help people. And so it became quite clear in my role as COVID-19 director and hearing heartbreaking stories every day from a lot of different people um, that, you know, we were really in a desperate situation. And so we, we needed to do something to raise awareness as to what was going on and the economic genocide that the town of Southampton, the state of New York was waging against us because, um, you know, it's, just, it's really a human right violation. And if anyone knew about this, I mean, at, as soon as people hear about what we're going through, it, it's just, it's so horrible. Um, and it's so wrong and unjust um, what New York State and the town of Southampton are doing. Yeah, so you're, you're fighting it in this kind of, I guess, you know, you would say like, regulatory space or, you know, state level, I guess, government um, space. Um, and I, from what I've read, you've been winning a lot of those cases because as you did all this work to show that you are a sovereign nation and you have these land rights, um, you know, obviously the U.S. government and lots of local governments have, in so many places, never honored those um, rights. Um, but you're fighting it on this level. But then can you talk a little bit more about, you know, the decision to have this encampment um, along the highway, um, you know, sovereign encamp? Um, and talk about that as a tactic, because um, it's something that um, we've seen a lot in Indigenous struggle from Standing Rock. Um, yeah, could you just talk a little bit about why you chose to do this camp? Sure, definitely. So this camp was really organized by one of our elders who was a very active member of the American Indian movement. And so these types of occupations are known to really send a very loud message. Um, you know, with these types of occupations, you know, you can put out a call and have a, a whole lot of people come and join you and stand with you. Um, people who are ready and willing and committed to your cause to do whatever's needed to be done. And so, um, you know, it really makes people pay attention. Um, we had almost an immediate response from the governor's office, from the attorney general's office, um, from the town, basically everyone that we named in our demands, we had almost an immediate response from. And so they took it very seriously. And, you know, we were, we, you know, it was it was really a campsite. I mean, we had a lot of work to do. Um, you know, we had to tend to fire, we had to cook our food, we had to, you know, take care of ourselves. Um, and you know, quite frankly, a hostile environment. I mean, we were we had everything. We were under a tornado watch. Our camp got destroyed by high winds. We had hail. We had snow. We had freezing cold temperatures, below freezing, um, you know, we went through it all a lot. And meanwhile, you know, the, the town and the state was getting increasingly alarmed about like, 
what our next actions would be, you know? So it really was effective and, but it really got everyone's attention right away and, and their response. Um, so, I mean, it was, it's, it's an effective way to raise awareness. Um, you know, November is, uh, Native American Heritage Month. So it was, a uh, really good timing, even though it was really cold. <laughs> we might have another one in warmer weather this summer if we get a, a vaccine. Um, but it's not, um, and we also controlled it. So a lot of these occupations sometimes would go on indefinitely, but we wanted to make it clear that our, our encampment would have an end date. Um, and then also we were really raising awareness as to what the conditions at Shinnecock are actually like. So one of the four warriors um, who organized this actually lived in a tent for two years. Um, you know, and so we have a situation on the res where things are so bad that we have elders who don't have running water or plumbing. They have an outhouse and, you know, it really gave people a chance to see like how bad things are at Shinnecock. And, you know, you talked about some of the, you know, the hard conditions that y'all went through living there. Are there any kind of, um, I'd say maybe like some of like the positive things, you know, I know when people are like spending time in community in that way, that's not a way that a lot of people spend time. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, I think that's probably another good outcome as well as obviously like getting the people you're targeting to pay attention. Um, that's kind of a movement building thing. What was this like? So many people became aware of the camp in so many different ways, whether they saw it on TV or they heard it on the radio. Um, and we got the attention of a lot of like well-known people um, who just wanted to learn more about our history and why we were there. And um, they wanted to know more about the lawsuit and they wanted to know why was New York doing this and why was the town of Southampton doing that. And once we told them, they were just blown away. Um, and we just gained so much support. And we built such a powerful network with so many different organizations. Um, you know, some, some people spent um, a long time with us. Some people could only spend a couple of days. Um, but I think that we, we really did a, an amazing job of amplifying our message to so many different groups who otherwise may have never, um, you know, mm -hmm. been interested in what we were doing. Yeah. I mean, I've seen so many posts on like Instagram about it and, you know, I had heard about it a little bit earlier. Um, I work with a group, uh, we're trying to fight a pipeline, um, that national grid is building in North Brooklyn and did a thing on indigenous people's day, um, with red nation where they showed the documentary, um, about, you know, the, the ongoing struggles you guys are, are going through. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Can we yeah. talk about that a little bit? Cause that's really like a lot of people are asking what's next. And so, um, we're really going to start ramping up our, um, you know, our underlying mission, which is, which is to purchase, protect and preserve what's left of the Shinnecock Hills. So, um, we have this situation where, um, we have basically this ma mass exodus of people coming from New York City and moving out into the Hamptons. And it's creating a situation where, you know, there's only so many homes and people are going to be trying to to start buying those vacant lots like as soon as we know it. So we don't have much time to really do that work to um, to get that land back. And so it's going to involve a lot of fundraising and reaching out to foundations and um, expanding our networks and really engaging with um, organized groups who focus on environmental work and climate work um, because those areas are really aligned with what we're trying to do at Shinnecock. Yeah, and I was wondering too if maybe you could talk a little bit more about you know the significance of of ending this encampment. Um, you called it the day of mourning. Um, you know, obviously it's it's a holiday. A lot of people in downstate New York um, celebrate as Thanksgiving, which is this very whitewashed version of what's actually happened. Um, you know, it's celebrated as a time that Indigenous people and pilgrims came together um, when really you know it was a celebration of of, of genocide. Um, and here you are, you know, in an area where it's some of the wealthiest people in America, um, encroaching on your indigenous territory. 
Um, and you know, I know the day before you all did a food drop. Um, cause as you mentioned, there are people who can't feed themselves. Um, you know, so for people to be celebrating this thing, that's like, Oh, at the time when, you know, pilgrims and indigenous people came together and people are starving, um, in your nation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the significance of that? Sure, definitely. So I do want to touch on our food drive because that was an amazing um, success and a good display of mutual aid. Um, we had used about $15,000 of the money that we had received in donations to um, prepare meals for 500 families that included um, healthy, nutritious, indigenous foods. Um, so it was really exciting um, to hand those out to just the local community because, again, there's a huge amount of food insecurity, not just on the Shinnecock Nation, but in the entire area. Um, but you just have billionaires and then you have working class people and everyone who's not a billionaire is really struggling. And so, um, yeah. And so for the national day of mourning, um, you know, that's, that's exactly what it is. Shinnecock people are, are, um, first contact. We know the struggle of colonization and we know about the slavery and the genocide and the epidemic disease and the pandemic disease and the land theft. And we know the horrible history because it's the same history everywhere. Every colonized person knows this history. And so um, it was really important to, um, to point to um, ending on such a significant date because because it's exactly the same story. I was so shocked when I went to Plymouth and I saw all these monuments to just this false American mythology of um, the pilgrims so-called la landing on, on Pilgrim Rock. Meanwhile, that's not the actual rock at all. And all of these monuments are false. And yet when the Shinnecock Nation tries to build a monument to their continued existence on their ancestral territory, the town of New York and this, um, the state of New York and the town of Southampton immediately try to stop it and erase that history. Um, it just really makes you stop and think um, because all of their monuments are, are false and um, yet we can't have a monument to the truth. And it really just goes right back to now being the time for a period of truth and reconciliation and improving the education system so that people are aware of the true history of this land and this country and its founding and the horrible and violent things that happened um, in, in this nation's early history. So you mentioned, um, you know, this campaign to make sure that you secure land. Um, so if people want to get involved in that, if they want to, you know, make sure they're supporting you in this lawsuit um, that you're fighting against New York State um, and other work, um, how can people get involved and, and learn more? I would recommend to follow us on Instagram. Our handle is Warriors of the Sunrise. And um, if you go to the link tree in our bio, you can find a link to our action kits. And we will be keeping everyone updated from that page on um, upcoming steps or actions that they can take. Cool. And anything else you'd like to add tonight? No, thank you so much for having me. You're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail.com. You can find us on our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter at NYCRPM. I'm Lee Zishi, and that was just an interview with Tila Troj, who is a member of the Shinnecock Nation. Um, but we are also joined today um, by some comrades from Suffolk DSA. Um, we have Tim, Christina, and and Hannah, who are also joining us. Um, so Christina, I'd like to um, start off with you and ask uh, how Suffolk DSA um, was involved in Sovereignty Camp 2020 that we just heard about. Well, uh, to start off with, sorry, it's Christine. Um, 
We got involved in the sort of beginnings of Sovereignty Camp. We were put in touch with uh, Tila and a few others in uh, Shinnecock and really um, were very honored to be invited into that space. So we did all we could to support um, um, in terms of we were building mutual aid. We uh, gave monetary support, uh, material support, and um, comrades themselves uh, went to the camp um, in the pre-days of camp to help set up. Um, and at camp itself, uh, a lot of us came through uh, either for, as Tila was saying, a few days uh, for how, or for however long we could manage to get out there and stay out there to really be with them, learn from them in, in their, their campsite. And, uh, oh yeah, and we were also, they had a number of roadside protests um, that we were there for, uh, action hours that we were able to, the action hours being uh, digital in nature, able to um, direct members and get, you know, as many people as possible into, trying to think of what else. Uh, it was like a lot of logistics, like background work that, you know, almost nobody wants to hear about. <laughs> But, but that stuff is all really, really important. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so even though it's hard to get into details on the air, it seems like uh, Suffolk DSA comrades are really doing a lot of work um, in kind of various areas, uh, mutual aid, logistically showing up um, in support and uh, directly being there. Um, and this seems to be a really, really crucial struggle. So, Tim, overall, how does... Um, this ongoing struggle uh, for sovereignty for the Shinnecock Nation, how does it relate uh, to your work of uh, building democratic socialist power on Long Island? I, yeah, first of all, like, yeah, for us, like, solidarity is unconditional. So, like, we've been supporting Shinnecock land struggle just regardless of politics. Like, we spent the week of the election or the days leading up to the election, including the election on territory, like in a struggle that pre that predates the United States. So that was like a really like wild experience just first off. Um, but like for us, part of building power on Long Island is uh, like it means coalition building. And that's what part of this was like when I joined steering committee uh, last year, I was the secretary of the chapter. We were good on infrastructure because we're, you know, a small, young suburban chapter. We were weak on coalition building and Shinnecock Indian Nation was on top of my list. Like we have to, you know, build solidarity with them and support them in, you know, land struggle. And it was a, like earlier in the year in January, uh, we went, there was a large roadside protest that predates sovereignty camp. We saw, you know, I saw a dump truck dump cement on an Indian burial ground. And that was a really radicalizing experience for me. And it, like it, for some people in our chapter, like I remember that Shinnecock Nation protest was their first DSA event or not. It wasn't a DSA event, but it was the first thing that we had brought like a major. We brought, I think, 10 people to that protest. It was sometimes it's their first time holding a sign stuff. Uh, you know, it was. it's also part of just the political education process, I think, in real life. You know, it's not reading a book. It's part of the decolonization and unlearning process that uh like brings about you know further radicalization in people's lives and more engagement in you know struggles that aren't necessarily like taxing the rich and stuff like that um so building power co is coalition building and part of the decolonization and unlearning process for people yeah i am um, one of the i guess probably the thing that brought me into dsa was kind of i had been doing all this organizing in 2016 against fracking and didn't really have like then an organizing space and they were the ones that were really in solidarity um, with groups like American Indian Community House and other people leading defundment movements um, here in New York. And that's ending up kind of how I ended up an eco-socialist. Um, but you know, in addition to you all supporting this indigenous land struggle in one of the wealthiest places um, in the country, you are also doing um, defund the police work in a very conservative pro-police area. Um, your chapter is currently running a campaign called um, uh, Steve and Tim Listen. Um, tell us what that's all about, Tim. 
Is it Steve and Tim? Is there another Tim or did I mess that up? Okay, got it right. Great. Tell us what it's all about. Tim Tim is the name of our uh, the name of our district attorney. But um so our, like our defund the police like campaign, this is a very early stage thing. We're not really even calling it defund the police. I mean, of course we support, you know, uh, defunding and abolition, but uh on Long Island, there are, you know, there are two counties, just to get us situated with geography. There's Nassau County, uh, which is closest to Brooklyn and Queens, and then there's Suffolk County, like which is like the middle of the island all the way uh, out east to the Hamptons. We don't have mayors. We have county executives. So the, the two, like the Suffolk County executive, his name is Steve Ballone, and our district attorney is Tim Seney. Uh, they are both, you know, there, there are no progressives on Long Island, really. Um, in fact, th there was a recent city and state New York profile of County Executive Ballone just last week, and the headline was, uh, I believe the full headline was, the last of the New York centrists. So that, so they are, they're two boring centrist hacks uh, that's, you know, that's like, they're bought off by cop money, and so that's who they are, just to, that's, so that's who Steve and Tim are. Um, but so Steve Ballone in September uh, put together a the Suffolk County Police Reform and Reinvention Task Force, uh, which was months after months of delay uh, in response to Cuomo's um, mandate for local governments to come up with like local police reform to be submitted by April uh, 2021. I don't know what that has looked like in uh, New York City, but they have this task force is a joke for us um it's almost no community members full of you know electeds cops cop union people a couple of civics groups and nonprofits, but not a lot of like dsa people let's say um and their meetings are held in private however there are eight public listening sessions and the thing about these listening sessions is, like, I, normally I would tell you that the task force is trash and the listening sessions are going to be a waste of your time. But, yeah, Long Island is a, I, th I would say, skews conservative, and there is a heavy, heavy police presence on Long Island. It's a very strong cop culture. That is not exaggerated at all. The thing is, this these listening sessions present an opportunity for there to be some conversation that has never, ever, ever, ever happened here. Um, like the Black Lives Matter protests that really got reignited this summer, like we were pinching, Suffolk DSA was pinching ourselves, you know, uh, like there were all these organic protests just popping up and like it, that has never happened here either. So, uh, we've encouraged people to give testimony at these public hearings and, uh, just, it has given us an easy ask because Steve Ballone and district attorney Tim Sini are not attending these meetings. So it tells us that, oh, listening is not a priority to them. It's, it's a total joke. So we started this campaign to bring Steve and Tim to the listening sessions. We had people, just basic stuff like calls and emails to the offices. And we've heard that they, I, I've heard from multiple people that people in the county are upset that they're apparently like being watched now. Like a call and an email is like a really, it's a threat that they have not like witnessed yet. Um, and so we're asking people to bring, to contact them and tell them to come to the listening sessions. Um, they're not coming because they're bought off by cop money. Steve Ballone, uh, got $830,000, uh, was reported last year and district attorney Tim Sini got $329,000. Um, that has, part of that has a lot to do with how screwed up local Long Island politics is, which maybe you can squeeze in this conversation. Uh, but they're both they're both bought up by the bought off by cop money and uh they're starting to feel the heat but it's again defund police stuff is in the early stages for us yeah which is totally reasonable you're kind of taking an assessment of uh the reality on the ground and i actually would love for you to cut further i mean we don't have uh all the time in the world here but i think it would be useful uh for you to elaborate on kind of the the political context of Long Island, you hit on the fact that cop money, it has power here in New York City, but uh, the cop unions can probably push things over the edge more in a way, even in a, in a place like Long Island. And people, I think, really don't recognize how much cops are paid in New York City, and then they can go buy a nice home in Long Island, and then they can be kind of part of this 
more reactionary community that's looking to protect its property taxes than looking to kind of uh, attack people here in uh, the city and all across. So I think that's uh, so. If you want to elaborate, uh, please like elaborate on the sort of the local politics in Long Island. And if you also want to just expand on the the fifth listening session, which was last night, how did that go? Yeah, uh, like first of all, a lot of people. Uh, a lot of cops on Long Island join the NYPD, and when they get the call for Suffolk and Nassau, they join Suffolk and Nassau because it pays so much more. Uh, I believe we have the highest paid cops in the nation. Uh, maybe Christine or Hannah can correct me if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> um, but, like, local Long Island politics is screwed up because... So, so there's no progressives here. The three centrist hacks are Steve Ballone... Tim Seney is a district attorney. I mean, we can bicker about whether that's a political position or not, but the other main guy is Rich Schaefer. Uh, and he's kind of, he's a, you know, he's the head of Suffolk County, uh, the Suffolk County Democratic Committee, uh, town of Babylon, like chairman. He's kind of like Andrew Cuomo in that he likes Republicans in power to like wield power for himself. Babylon, I believe, is one of the smallest like incorporated towns on Long Island, and it has like the most power. Um, that's where the three of them live. And uh, so Ballone, so Rich Schaefer has been like the, the kingmaker on Long Island, like the silent kingmaker that only people in Babylon know and no one else has ever heard of. The kind of person who hangs out at the deli in the morning and like greets like Babylon as they get their bacon and chicken and egg sandwich or whatever. Uh, so Steve Ballone, uh, you can read this too in that city and state New York profile, but basically Steve Ballone comes up under Rich Schaefer's wing. Uh, and then eventually becomes the county executive. And the way I've heard it, uh, he co- go, he calls a meeting with Rich Schaefer and is like, hey, I want to, like, um, these are the people I want taken out so government can run more efficiently, Rich. Like, what do you think about it? And Rich didn't budge on the power. Um, Rich Schaefer is, like, again, the silent kingmaker, and he was, he, they don't talk anymore. So they have a, it's a, there's a wild, like Long Island, there's a wild, like democratic schism within uh, Long Island politics, at least in Suffolk County. Nassau may be a little bit different, but so they don't get along and it's like, like, there's no progress, there's no chance really for a progressive to get in. There's no chance for progressivism to really develop within the democratic party here. It has to come, if at all, it has to come from an organization like DSA and you know, liberals here don't really want to have that conversation yet, unfortunately. But uh, there's no progressives here because because Rich Schaefer says no, and the cop money buys a lot here. Uh, the stuff at PBA, like recently, because we've started tweeting about them and because of this, we've mentioned them in this campaign, they recently blocked us on Twitter, which I, I was like really stoked about. Um, and our particip- but so our yeah so our call got us to be blocked by the PBA. It also doubled the amount, doubled the speakership at the fifth session last night. But the downside is uh, that it's also attracting uh, fans of cops. I don't know if they're necessarily hearing about our campaign or it's the PBA being like, hey, we like we had the Sayville superintendent of schools like come like last night to like, and he was like, oh, they're great with the kids. And like, uh, it's, it's, so in that, like, it's, uh, th- there's pluses and minuses with every step, you know, as you organize, as we know. Um, yesterday, the legislate, the Suffolk County legislature, like was really resistant to, th- there's a bill now, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. It's some, you know, jumble of numbers, but uh, to reform like the campaign donation uh laws on Long Island, and would you believe that Suffolk County legislatures are like, my constituency likes the low crime rates here. We love the police. So there was, yeah, there was a major, I mean, it wasn't like a page long, it was like maybe half the page in Newsday today, like our local daily paper about how resistant the legislature is to like banning, you know, uh, un- public sector union money, which, you know, of course, in, which in here means the police. Uh, so they're really resistant to the idea of like not taking cut money. Uh, so that that will be a struggle for us moving forward. Uh, but yeah, pluses and minuses like at each step that you take. 
Yeah, I'm sure it's probably the PBA recruiting. I know when we fight pipelines and there's hearings, there's always all the workers, you know, they, a lot of times they don't even speak up or we hear the same talking points and you're like, yep, you definitely did not come here organically. Um, but you know, the fact that a lot of, um, police do live out in Long Island and then come into New York City. Um, there's also been some fairly large, you know, back the blue rallies in Suffolk. Um, Hannah, I'm wondering if you can talk about a little bit like what it's like organizing in that terrain. You know, um, there's clearly a lot of anti-police sentiment here in New York City. What's it like organizing where you're at? Yeah, um, it's definitely not easy. I mean, we're not going to have, you know, watching the the huge like thousands of people in the city w- marching against the police or for defunding the police, whatever, you know, on that spectrum where they are. Um, Because, yeah, as we've been talking about, you know, this is cop country, um, Suffolk specifically, but NASA as well, right? They live here in our towns, whether they're NYPD officers or Suffolk or NASA or one of the other 70 um, different police forces that we have across Long Island, because it's not just the NASA and Suffolk County police, it's also town police and all of these other smaller police um, station or police departments that we have to, you know, figure out where they're getting their money from and all of this stuff when we talk about defunding the police. Um, But yeah, like, for example, I'm sure a lot of you saw that video of the NYPD officer, like very early in the, um, the days of the marches uh, in, in New York city, shoving that like very, like small person that went flying um that cop actually went to my high school and christine's high school as well um right so it's really easy for people out here um to go down that like reasoning of yeah and as uh tim is saying this that person actually did have a seizure from that but um yeah everyone should be like oh there there are some good cops because so many people know a cop right it's their parents it's their cousins it's their their siblings um yeah so it's gonna be a while i think until we see thousands march in the street against this but the problems are the same with the cops here as they are there right the racism and the brutality and all of that um so out here, it's like we really have to focus on building solidarity with like-minded people and finding them and, you know, uh, bringing us all together. Um, and as we've also, as Tim was talking about, there's so much cop money in our government um, and as well as these over 70 police departments um, that I think a lot of people are convinced that the forces are just too big to go up against. And so that's why I think it's really important for us to be at these listening sessions, right? Not because I think that we're going to convince the task force to defund the police or that we're going to convince these cops to stop murdering people. Um, But just to let people in Suffolk County know that there are abolitionists here um, and people who don't think that way so that they can come organize with us and we can, you know, grow our numbers. Yeah, sh- you know, shifting the train and uh, creating an opening for new political space, a sort of ideological struggle taking the first step in, as you've all been describing, this very difficult political uh, geography that you're living in. And I, we have a, a last question that we want to ask for all of you, but we also want to um, open up the phone line so we can get that rolling and we can jump right into that after you've addressed uh, our next question, but just want to let our listeners know that we've got about 10 minutes left in the show. So please feel free to call in at 212-209-2877. Again, that number is 212-209-2877. And I want you all to get at this, but uh, Christine, since we haven't heard from you in a little bit, I want you to get the first shot. So like beyond this uh, defund the police campaign, this specific kind of um, ideological struggle that you're waging by uh, encouraging people to attend these listen sessions, um, how else is a Suffolk uh, DSA like working to build working class power in socialism in your region in Long Island? Uh, I would say, and this is how I directly got involved in Suffolk DSA in particular, um, I was when I lived in the city with uh, New York City DSA, Um, but through our mutual aid efforts, um, our chapter and our uh, sister chapter, NASA, um, both run pretty solid mutual aid networks. Um, 
uh, to touch on what Tila spoke about, food insecurity on Long Island uh, in Suffolk County, it was 11% of people in, um, uh, in uh, it was, sorry, it was 6.3% of people in 2018, and it's now up to about 11% of people in 2020, and that number is only going to get worse. So I think for us, our efforts of focusing on mutual aid, food insecurity, addressing those needs, um, as well as uh, partnering with uh, some organizations that maybe Tim and Hannah can speak more on, uh, part of coalition building, obviously, but organizations that do address these kinds of things and in work in the real spirit of mutual aid, I think, is um, one way that we're going to help build socialism in the suburbs. Yeah, like one of the organizations that, uh, two things that I think we've done that like, yeah, that have helped to build socialism here is one, I remember in, uh, I went to St. John the Baptist, I asked this in high school, I went to Catholic school, they had a pretty racist hair policy that last year we worked on a campaign, uh, they had an open house uh, where all the kids, all the families came in to like tour the schools and five or six of us, it was a very small number. Uh, it was way back in like, it was one of my first organizing things. We held signs like change the racist hair policy. So every car uh, that went into the parking lot saw the signs. Next year, the racist hair policy was gone. So like just small stuff like that in small suburban chapters, I think means a lot, especially when you're dealing with like young kids, which is important, you know, just obviously for all the, the you know, the, the next generation. Um, but there are other, yeah, local organizations like uh, All Included and Treated. Uh, shout out to our friends, uh, Devon and Liz Hoya. They call themselves Ain't. Just a project that feeds like the houseless, you know, anyone who's having like uh, mental issues or if you have a substance abuse disorder, people who are like living in Ross Memorial Park in Brentwood. Uh, Brentwood is one of the more like uh, impoverished areas on Long Island. Um, and they like they've had we've started doing court support for them. Uh, some people were arrested for feeding, you know, hungry and homeless people in Ross Memorial Park. The park got raided as a result. Uh, Devon and Latoya are pretty skilled cop watchers just locally in the area. They're the people that you go to if you, you know, like need a place to stay for a night or two. Um, and when Devon got arrested, we were like among the first people organizing to help get him out. Um, he's currently having a court case that's seeming to drag on. Um, so we're supporting them that way, just supporting like, yeah, local organizations that are doing great work that are, you know, un sometimes unaffiliated politically. Uh, and other times people like are, you know, people are stoked to hear that DSA is like helping out with stuff like just this and Shinnecock Nation, like we started the show with. Yeah, I mean, it seems like we've we've lost Hannah, uh, and maybe momentarily, or I don't know, for the the rest of the hour. I would we'll, we'll love to hear what she had to say, but I think you um, you both are pointing out some really really uh, important ways to engage in the struggle, and you have to kind of measure your resources and where you can most effectively uh, get involved and kind of maybe pull more people into the movement. So even something that seems small can over time build power and kind of transform the way people think about politics and how to organize. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's uh, those small things can really pile up in an, an important way. And we have two uh, calls that are on the line. I want to uh, get to the first of them. Uh, you are live on WBAI revolutions per minute. What's your name and what's your question and or comment? Uh, my name is Ed. I live on Staten Island. I used to live in Suffolk County back, <laughs> excuse me, back in the 80s and was involved in volunteer picket lines at the Suffolk County Jail around police brutality and overcrowding and also uh, organizing legal clinics in the Brentwood area and the Central Islip area because of the police brutality at the 3rd Precinct. And I would just it didn't sound like you were familiar with a lot of that history because a lot of the people who live there, you know, in Brentwood and Bayshore and Central Islip down in Windanch are, are people who have some experience with doing some of that organizing. Well, th thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Tim or Christine, have you got, have you been interacting with some maybe some more long term organizers who've been uh, engaged in the struggle? 
Uh, not, I mean, it's, it's mostly been eight. Like there have a lot of the like older organizers on Long Island are a little more centrist and conservative from what I've found, to be honest. Um, most people are involved with like, you know, stuff like, uh, they formed like, just like, you know, it's NWCP chapters and stuff like that. I don't know that there have been any like seriously veteran, really left-wing organizers against police brutality. Um, as far as I don't I'm know if the organizations have survived. It, like I said, it was 40, 30, 40 years ago. Um, some of the places you can also check is up at uh, Stony Brook University. Sure. That, that's know, actually where our chapter was started, at, at Stony Brook mostly. Um, and some of the people at uh, Union Hispanica or, or Pronto in Brentwood might remember some of that they're they're mostly um you know uh government funded charitable type programs but they they used to connect with those sort of things and there's also some connections with uh the immigrant worker organizing that's going on in Hempstead and West Hempstead so those people also connect. I know that we, there used to be at least half a dozen attorneys who made a living for like 20 years doing nothing but selling, suing the, the Suffolk County police. So oh. it's it's not like it's a secret issue. When, once you once you start connecting to the, the people who are involved in it. I, yeah, I mean, like I, I definitely don't mean to suggest that the brutality of the third precinct is not well known on Long Island. Like that is definitely true. They have a long storied history of being awful. Uh, but to um, your point about uh, continue. One one other group that you could get a hold of is the National Lawyers Guild. Yeah, of course. Because they they wrote an entire article about and did an entire investigation into the police brutality back in like 1971, 72, 73. Mm -hmm. So it. it, and, it Thank you so much, and I don't want to cut you off, but we, we have a couple other callers on the line, so I just want to make sure to give them a shot to get on the air. But we really we really appreciate you calling in and trying to forge these organizing connections. Is there a way to get um, a hold of DSA in, in uh, Staten Island? Yeah, absolutely. Um, DSA Staten Island, we've got a chapter out there. Their information uh, should be online if you want to look it up, uh, NYC DSA um, um, if you know what, we'll, I don't have that right in front of me, but if you tune in to us next week, we'll make sure, uh, to shout out, uh, NYC DSA Staten Island chapter and get all the, the information out there. But they, they normally outside of COVID are meeting in person. Uh, but I don't have all the info, but I really appreciate uh, that Ed, I just uh, I, I do want to make sure that we get to this last call. But thank you so much, and thank you for kind of sharing this organizing history and and hoping to build these connections that are going to be so important in the struggle going forward. So we are uh, jumping to our next caller. Uh, we have only we've got a, a barely any time left in the show, uh, so please just keep your uh, a comment brief. But what is your uh, name and what is your question or comment? Yes. Uh, this is Deborah uh, from the Bronx. Uh, I was uh, wanted to uh, talk on the issue of uh, sovereignty and the, um, I guess, uh, pursuing their rights of the Shinnecock people. Um, and I know if uh, had they, if it's an issue about whether or not you know they have rights to um, you know to their pro to to the property there. Uh, one of the uh, uh, opinions was about doing title search, and someone had said, oh, it goes back very far. I, I don't know how far it goes back, but I know if you're trying to uh, assert your, your rights, uh, there has to be at least one uh, one day a year where you close off you know, access to uh, property uh, so that you maintain your rights. If you don't do that, I think after a certain number of of uh, years, I don't know the number, maybe seven years or more, um, then you lose your right. Uh, the, the public can just freely come back and forth and, uh, on your territory. So has anybody 
uh, looked into that issue. Uh, hey, yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, th I believe the the lawyer that um, we had on the air uh, earlier, but is is no longer with us, uh, would probably be a better uh, person to address that issue. And we kind of are in the final minute of our show, so we, we can't get too deep into it. But thank you for raising uh, that concern. Thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate that. Um, is Just, uh, Tim or Christine, is there... Uh, one last thing you want our listeners to know, any way they can get it involved um, in w with the campaigns that you've been talking about. Uh, just keep it to like 20 seconds because we got to get off the air. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say in these COVID times, um, contacting us via our email or following us on our socials, which are really easy. It's Suffolk DSA um, on all of them. Um, is a really easy way to find out what we're doing and get in touch with us so we can, you know, plug you in to the network more. And if you guys want to make calls or emails on uh, our behalf, if you want to go to bit.ly uh, slash Steve and Tim listen, that's the link to the toolkit for that campaign. Uh, and then the link tree for Warriors of the Sunrise to learn all about the Shinnecock struggle. Well, thank you so much for sharing that information and joining us in Revolutions Per Minute. Lee, I will give you the final word tonight. Uh, yeah, just remember we're on, you know, occupied Lenape land right now. So the land struggles are integral to our climate struggles. So, and thank you all so much for joining us. I'm so glad we're bridging the gap between, you know, the city and the far off Long Island. So thanks so much for joining us. And we'll be back next week, Wednesday at 9 p.m. You've been listening to Revolutions Per Minute, and we'll see you out in the streets.